Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to, to come here and speak at the Linnean Society in the same room, I'm told, as, uh, as the Darwin and uh, uh, Wallace uh, debate was, uh, or, or rather, positions were read out. So this, this is uh, not going to be so august, but I think it's something which everybody has an opinion on. And uh, it's an idea, I think, which is, is gaining resonance with us. And um, through deeper understanding and appreciation of this idea, I think we can, we can re realize and recognize some of the dangers of uh, rapid environmental change and try and respond appropriately to them. So what I want to do um, this evening is to just dip into the subject of shifting environmental baselines. And uh, it was Brian Rosen who uh, has put me up to this. Where is Brian? Uh, there we are. Um, who, who has put me up to speaking about shifting baselines and is, is busy uh, concocting a meeting on shifting baselines for the society, which would look into things in much more detail. So this really is just a, a dip of the toe into the subject. And uh, I apologize if it seems uh, too swift at times. So the shifting baselines idea uh, originated really in about the mid-1980s uh, to early 1990s uh, or in terms of it being recognized as a distinct uh, concept. And it was really encapsulated by a couple of people, Jeremy Jackson and uh, Daniel Pauley, and they are uh, marine scientists. Jeremy Jackson is an ecologist and uh, uh, evolutionary biologist. Daniel Pauley is a fishery scientist, and Jeremy Jackson had, had started to read old books. And um, I've seen your marvelous collection of old books upstairs, and, and there's so much that you can learn from old books. And he was particularly interested in the Caribbean, and, uh, and then started reading his way around the world from there. And, and he discovered these stories of incredible abundance from the past of, uh, of wildlife. And, uh, it couldn't square it with his present experience of the environment in the Caribbean. And so he began to think about the sorts of changes that had taken place and uh, why it was that these uh, uh, observations had been largely forgotten. Daniel Pauley uh, was uh, thinking about things differently. He was coming at it from a fisheries perspective and um, fisheries science is one of those subjects which um, is obsessed with the present and the future. Because really, what fishery scientists want to do is to determine how many fish it's safe to catch next year, for which you really only need to know how many fish there are right now, or so most fishery scientists uh, believed. And so it's all about doing your monitoring and assessment, and making the calculations, uh, running the stuff through the models, and coming up with a number that then can be um, uh, brutalized by politicians uh, in, in, uh, uh, <laughs> and all of your hard work is as naught, perhaps. But anyway, he was wondering why it was that, um, that, that fishery science tended to ignore uh, past abundances of species. And, and those uh, old uh, timers reports of fish being more plentiful in the past, I mean, fishermen are great people for uh, saying, oh, it was uh, much better in my day, you know, when we were catching all these huge fish and uh, so many and the boat was almost sinking under the weight of herring or whatever. So, um, you know, those sorts of anecdotes were out there and yet they, again, didn't square with present experience. And so Daniel Pauley published this little note. It's just, just one page. It's more of a letter in Trends in Ecology and Evolution in um, the early 90s. And, and he uh, was putting together these ideas for the first time. And he gave it a catchy name, Shifting Baseline Syndrome. And uh, I suppose if he'd been British, it would have been Moving Goalpost Syndrome or something like that. But uh, it's Shifting Baseline Syndrome, which I, I think has a, a certain value and, uh, and uh, usefulness about it. So. This is the sort of thing that Jeremy Jackson was struck by when he was reading his way through the early literature. And uh, this is a piece by William Dampier, um, who uh, was a pirate, um, sometime diplomat, navigator, um, uh, privateer, all sorts of things that he did in his career. He, he traveled around the world uh, a couple of times, and um, 
he wrote about it. He was, he was famous in his day. His portrait hangs in the National Portrait Gallery. And he visited places like Juan Fernandez off the coast of Chile and was stunned by the sheer exuberance and abundance of life there and the extraordinary number of fur seals. Well, of course, it wasn't long before uh, his stories uh, were the talk of London and um, uh, people were equipping ships to go out and exploit these uh, fur seals. And so the, the, the present abundance of fur seals in Juan Fernandez is nothing like um, the abundance that Dampier came across. And then there are uh, images, I mean, the, the same sort of stories were present from um, the New World when settlers first went across the Atlantic. They discovered incredible abundance and uh, numbers of fish in the uh, estuaries and rivers of the New World. And this is just one example from the west coast of the United States. Uh, by the time this photograph was taken, the east coast rivers had been largely emptied of these sturgeon, but they were just as abundant on the east coast when um, people first arrived there and started setting up their settlements. And then things like this. I, I, I love this quote from George Shelbock in uh, the early 1800s, uh, sorry, yeah, early 18th century. Uh, whales, grampuses, and other fish of a monstrous bulk are in such numbers off the coast of Patagonia that they were really offensive to us very often. For they would come sometimes so close to us as to stifle us with their stench when they blew, and would lie so near us that I frequently thought it impossible to escape striking upon them on every send of a sea. Now, can you imagine whales so abundant that they, they would endanger your vessels and that they would uh, be uh, uh, this, this smell of whale breath? This was also something that uh, La Perouse noted from Monterey Bay off the west coast of North America. And, uh, and he said there was a cadaver stench of uh, whale breath. I mean, very few of us get close enough to smell a whale's breath. And uh, uh, I certainly have never had that luck in my life. Um, but uh, the, the numbers were extraordinary. Again, totally at odds with our present experience. And similarly, uh, with, with turtles, uh, just huge numbers uh, were being described in these past accounts of, um, of these animals. And uh, this, this from Oregon, a place that now has very few salmon, um, but in the early 20th century and in the 19th century, they, they not only had tons, they had huge individuals as well. And closer to home, here we have a scene from St. Ives. Now, uh, St. Ives has nothing to compare with this today. And if you look at the size of the fish lying on the shore here, you know, they're certainly waist high on, on the people who are standing on the shore. And even given the, the possibility that those people were a little shorter than we are uh, on average today, these are big fish. They're, they're probably mostly hake uh, on, in this scene. And you can see the numbers that are being brought in there. And on the east coast of the UK, there was a stunning uh, abundance of uh, pelagic fish too, things like the herring that was being landed into to Lowestoft and at the peak of the herring season something like a thousand boats were working off the coast there. So what is it then that shifting baselines are? And if you go back to that paper of Daniel Pauly's, it, it, you know, you can kind of pluck out the essence of it, but it's not very well articulated. It's kind of come together since then. And, and it can be summarized in just a sentence. They are Intergener intergenerational changes in the way we perceive the state of our world. And I, I'm not going to say our environment, although it has been mainly applied uh, in an environmental context, uh, and uh, particularly in a marine environmental context because of the, uh, the, the discipline of the people who have really uh, thought about it longest and hardest. But it's a concept that applies across, I think, all of human experience. And the more we think about it, the more it, uh, it explains things that we, uh, we, we feel about the world uh, around us. And I, I'll get on to more of that as I run through the, the presentation. So what predisposes us to uh, shifting baseline syndrome? Well, I think there are three key things. Uh, and the first is that most of our uh, values and ideas are shaped fairly early in life. There's a very strong influence of our nurturing environment. And, and really, by the ages of uh, about 10 or so, we, we have, uh, we've got a world view which is then 
not very malleable. Um, we, we obviously do change our ideas and attitudes, but there's a certain fixity in there, a foundation upon which everything else is built. And then, of course, we have to have a changing world around us. Um, and so those changes, then, uh, are things that are experienced that, that mean that the environment, the world, is experienced differently by different generations. And so, you know, what your children will, will experience is going to be different from what you experienced in your childhood. And then uh, uh, the other thing that really factors into it is one of those many human cognitive biases. And uh, the particular one here is valuing your own personal experience, your direct experience, uh, far more highly than the accounts of others. And that's one of the reasons why we often dismiss these sorts of descriptions from the historic past, because they, they, they're discordant with our own observations. And so we think it can't be true. They must be exaggerating. This is, this is ridiculous. Nobody could uh, possibly uh, step on fish uh, as they rode their horse through a river because fish aren't that common. They could easily get out of the way. But uh, no, uh, you know, you can read these things uh, very directly, uh, and uh, if they're to be believed, then the environment must have been very different in the days when those accounts were being written. So Jackson uh, and his colleagues, um, you know, kind of took this idea and ran with it. And in the early um, uh, 2000s, they came out with a very um, uh, influential paper, which was looking at historical change in marine ecosystems and. This is a very useful kind of summary diagram of um, the, the sorts of changes and roughly the temporal ordering of those changes in the environment. So we have exploitation coming first as, as people expanded across the planet. Then we start to get uh, some pollution problems coming in, mechanical habitat destruction. And in the case of, uh, of rivers and estuaries, for example, that habitat destruction comes in the form of the construction of dams. And, and we did that to uh, acquire power on the whole um, because uh, uh, you know, we, we didn't have electricity in the past. So all, all of the, the agricultural product, produce that needed milling, for example, the, the, the water was the power behind it. And then we have uh, introduced species as a result of globalization and the increased movement of people around the world and climate change coming in. Uh, really towards the tail end of this. And all of these things are agents of change to the world around us and um, the way we think about it. And then, you know, what, what they, uh, he came up with in a different paper, published the same year, was this nice little diagram which really looks at um, the historic past and what it might have looked like in terms of um, the sorts of uh, creatures that were living there. Uh, and what um, we have as our, our baseline of experience and uh, what is going on right now. And uh, in Jeremy Jackson's case, um, he's now in his 60s, uh, and Daniel Pauly is also in his 60s, and so their, their personal experience extended back some way. Um, and uh, their baseline was set at a time when uh, for example, on coral reefs, which is one of their areas of interest, there was a lot of living habitat structure, there were lots of corals out there, but there weren't very many big fish uh, or big animals around. Things like the Caribbean monk seal were extinct, uh, for example, and um, uh, the, the, the uh, amount of life on those reefs had been diminished. And so the baseline that they had of what the world is like lacked some of the things that were there previously. And so this, is, this was the idea behind historical ecology, is that we can start piecing together a better understanding of what the world was like. Now, obviously, that's in the sea, but the same sort of thing applies on land, roughly speaking. Um, obviously, uh, the world has experienced massive losses of megafauna over time. Um, there is a human hand in much of that loss, according to uh, quite a few very influential papers, uh, uh, as well as a, a climatic signal a, a, as well. And this is my own personal experience of, uh, of shifting baselines. I grew up in the town of Wick on the north coast of Scotland in the 1970s. And, and when I was growing up there, this is what uh, I, I experienced directly. Wick Harbour 
was a very quiet, sleepy place. It was uh, great to go around and, and mess around down there. I mean, th these boys might as well uh, be uh, me. I, I could easily have been in that scene. Um, and there were a few trawlers, uh, one or two herring boats, but really uh, it was a, a very quiet place. And that contrasts considerably with the, the, the scene before. So here it is in the 1920s, a little bit busier, quite a lot of barrels on the, on the quayside, and uh, a, a rather different scene. Then we wind the clock back a little bit more, and it really starts to fill up. There's uh, a lot of uh, steam herring drifters in the harbor there, and the, uh, the, the herring gutting on the shoreline. Here, uh, uh, about 20 years earlier, you can see the fleet just about to depart for the herring grounds. It's the evening now, all the sails are raised. Uh, and then if you roll back to the middle of the, uh, you know, earlier in the 19th century, then you get a scene which was extraordinary. And if you go back to the 1860s, Wick was the largest fishing port in the world. Uh, and I didn't think very much about this, to be honest. Uh, and I just wonder why, you know, was I stupid or something? Yeah. There were pictures of these old scenes in the, the, the local library, but it just never really crossed my mind as to why that was. And, and why is it that this place is different now? Well, obviously, there aren't the number of fish there anymore that there used to be in the 19th century. And, and the, the herring shoals, the huge herring shoals that Thomas Pennant described, for example, in his zoological text of 1776, were gone. I mean, they, they, they were... There was still herring out there. People were catching it, but the 1970s, it really crashed um, and uh, put a lot of people out of business. But it had been gone for a long time in terms of that former abundance. So one of the things that I, I, I got very interested in uh, at university and in, in later life, you know, thinking back at that change, that uh, enormous transition in WIC, uh, and thinking about where other transitions might have occurred, um, I, I wanted to investigate the shifting baseline syndrome more quantitatively. So the, the, the whole framing of the concept was uh, very kind of uh, arm waving. It, it made intuitive sense, but nobody had proved that um, different generations perceived the state of the environment differently, uh, as obvious as that might seem. And I, I'm just like, every other scientist in that I like to prove the obvious using uh, lots, of, um, <laughs> lots of direct detailed observations and uh, some statistics. So, so here's this uh, kind of uh, setting in which this could be put to the test. The Gulf of California, otherwise known as the Sea of Cortez, um, uh, the, it's the arm of Western Mexico. And uh, this observation from a, a, a retired Hollywood director uh, who is um, Ray Cannon, uh, and ex ex an extraordinary abundance of fish there from his experience, and these photographs suggest very big fish as well. Well, one of my students um, uh, on the left here, Andrea Sainz Arroyo, went out into the fishing communities of the Gulf of uh, California and uh, started to ask people from different generations about their experiences of fishing. And so what, what we've got on this uh, right-hand panel is the, is the finding. She split the sample into three different generations. So we have young generations, which is uh, you know, up, well, everyone up to about 40, um, middle-aged, 40 to 60, and then uh, all the generations, I think, uh, 60 plus. So looking at this, um, just trying to see if there is a, uh, whoops, no, if there is a, a laser pointer. No, I, I shall... Describe it. So we've got young, middle-aged, and old uh, on this graph. And, and this is the, she asked them questions like, you know, how many species did you use to fish uh, uh, in the past that, that, that are now no longer common? And, or have, rather, how many species do you know of um, that used to be uh, um, abundant but are, are no longer common? And the younger generations didn't really know about very many at all. The older generations knew about a lot more species. They'd ha they had much more experience. And then the same thing was exactly true of the number of fishing sites. People fished a lot more places in the past than they did today. Uh, and then there's this coastal offshore index. And, and the, the, um, the higher the number, the further offshore those people are fishing. And so the younger generations were fishing a long way offshore now, but the older generations were able to 
take their fish right from the coast. And those pictures of those huge fish with Ray Cannon, uh, they were just fished off the jetty, uh, literally. So uh, very easily available. And then she asked uh, about um, one particular species, the Gulf grouper, which these two gents are, are busy hauling onto their boat, and asked them, you know, what was your best day's catch in terms of the number of uh, Gulf groupers, and what year did you catch it in? And, and she was hoping that people would remember such a memorable experience of, you know, well, the best day was, uh, you know, 20 of these things, and it was in 1958 or whatever. And sure enough, uh, that there was a good recollection of these things. And, and she asked them to approximate the size of that fish. Uh, it, you know, on, on, so this is, this is where fishermen's tails can come in. But, uh, but you know, they, they drew it on the ground. And uh, from a length-weight relationship, she was able to calculate how big it must have been. And then, um, you know, what year did you catch that largest Gulf Cooper in? And, and, all of the findings here are in accordance with the, the shifting baseline uh, syndrome. So we've, we've got this environmental change which is taking place. Um, people are experiencing the environment very differently. Uh, and what's interesting though is that the, the younger generations just seemed unaware that the, uh, the environment was more productive and that there was a greater abundance of big animals and that there was a whole variety of species that they no longer got but they uh, uh, their, their parents or their grandparents did. And so there was this lack of uh, uh, communication, really, between the different generations there. And even though those people were uh, often living in the same houses, and uh, what's interesting is that there was this, this loss of knowledge, even in people who had an everyday experience with the environment. So, you know, they had a connection with the world, but they weren't appreciating the way that that world used to be in terms of the, the younger generations. There's another marvelous study of this shifting baseline syndrome from uh, the Florida Keys, which has been done by one of Jeremy Jackson's students, Lauren McLenahan. And uh, this relies on a database, or I should say a database, a collection of photographs that people took on the dock side as people came in from a day's uh, recreational fishing. And this is uh, a day in the 1950s, it's fairly typical in that there are dozens and dozens of pictures just like this uh, coming in in the 1950s. And then we have the 1970s, and here you can see um, the, 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 the catches are still plentiful, but the, the really big fish aren't there anymore. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, there's a shift in composition that has taken place over that period of decades. And then coming forward to the present, this is the sort of thing that typically people are bringing back in with them. And uh, it's, it's a, a much reduced uh, catch compared to the past. And so there's been a real shift in that environment. And, and you might ask the question, why aren't people there jumping up and down and demanding action to restore the abundance of uh, fish off the coast of Florida? And yet the people whose livelihoods depend on this, the ones who are running these recreational boats seem uh, incredibly reluctant to, um, to, to ask for action, to uh, undertake actions themselves, and um, there, there hasn't really been this demand, and that, that is a manifestation in itself of this shifting baseline syndrome. Now, in an attempt to reset some baselines, some environmental groups have, uh, have started to do some interesting things. Here you can see uh, a piece that was used by Greenpeace in the European Parliament so that your, your MEP, when they're, uh, you know, in, in a moment in their extremely busy day, will be able to come and, you know, put their head uh, <laughs> through this and be taken with a cod of the past and uh, a cod of the present. Um, it has to be said, you know, hats off to Greenpeace for, for doing this, but this is not a typical cod of the past. This is, uh, <laughs> which I, <laughs> Uh, you know, they found one of the biggest in one of the uh, historical photographs there. But, uh, you know, one of the things which is interesting as a feature of the shifting baseline syndrome is how quickly a new normal takes over. And in eastern Canada, the, the, uh, the cod fishery collapsed in the 1990s. There's been a moratorium on cod fishing since 1992. The cod hasn't come back for various reasons. Uh, uh, to do with changing, 
changing state of the ecosystem, and indeed continued fishing of juvenile cod by uh, boats using fine mesh nets. And the, the fine mesh nets are actually uh, pursuing prawns uh, out on the shelf now. And so um, the fishery has switched from these cod, which uh, it's it targeted for hundreds of years, and now it's targeting shellfish, largely speaking. And the, the cod being gone means the shellfish thrive and uh, uh, the fishermen are happy. And the fishermen don't want the cod back now, actually, because it's easier to fish for lobsters and uh, snow crab and northern prawns than it was to go out and fish for the cod. So here we have this new kind of normal which has established itself in eastern Canada. And um, the desire for a comeback to the old state has been uh, diminished. So this is a, a, a nice little uh, characterization, I think, of the, of the shifting baseline syndrome operating in, in terms of fisheries and, and uh, <laughs> shifting waistline syndrome. I, 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 I suffer from it myself. But <laughs> anyway, there is one thing which is the same between uh, then and now, and that is um, that the experience of fishing is still being enjoyed. And that's perhaps one of the reasons why there isn't really any demand for action to recover the fish stocks in Florida, because people are still making a living. The, the ecosystem has been stripped of much of its larger life. The abundance has gone down a great deal, but the people coming there to enjoy recreational fishing, the younger generations, they've known nothing else. And so they're quite happy with the way things are. And there's, there's this ratcheting shift uh, in terms of the uh, expectations of the environment as time goes on. And I saw an experience, really. I had an experience of uh, that kind of ratcheting shift in environmental perception in the Caribbean. And um, during the uh, 1990s and 1980s, in fact, um, uh, there were some disease outbreaks which raced through the Caribbean. And by the time they had expended themselves, um, these coral disease outbreaks had taken out two of the biggest uh, reef-building coral species in the region. Um, the Elkhorn coral here and another one which is called the Staghorn coral, which is more delicate. But these, these were really the signature species of Caribbean coral reefs. And from uh, old fossil reefs, we know that they were dominant throughout the last 125,000 years or so at least. But in the aftermath of that die-off, we've, we've seen their abundance reduced to something like 1% of what it was before the outbreak of disease. And so you end up with reefs that look very much like this now, uh, where the, there are these, they're a little bit like elm trees, you know, where, where you have the skeleton of the elm still sitting there as a mute reminder of what it once was uh, in Britain, but now is no longer. Whereas in the Caribbean, what you have is the skeletons all covered over in algae um, and, uh, and dead as mute reminders, just the way the elm trees uh, remain today. And perhaps in 20 years time, the ash trees will too uh, be a reminder of um, what the English landscape once looked like. Um, but I, I had an experience with a group of people who were tourists just coming down to enjoy the Caribbean. They went snorkeling on this place where there were all these dead Elkhorn corals. And they came out and they said, the reef is wonderful. It's so full of life. And the corals were marvelous. And, uh, and I, I said, but they're all dead, those ones. And are they? Are they really? But they were green. And uh, yes, they're dead. They're covered in this algae. And so you know, for them, the coral reef was still wonderful. It was marvelous. But if you had the experience of them the way they were before, then you understood what had happened to them, whereas the younger generations just didn't, people who had no experience. And we see it around the UK uh, as well. You know, we, we've seen the loss of entire species go virtually unnoticed. So the angel shark, for example, if you go back to early 19th century accounts, the angel shark was something which was never abundant, really, but it wasn't uncommon. Um, and it was caught quite regularly. But it's now virtually extinct in the waters around the UK. It's, it's disappeared completely. The same sort of thing is true of the common skate. 
And the long nose skate and the white skate and the flapper skate, these big species that used to be abundant but have just disappeared completely under the radar. The first time people looked at the fishery records and suddenly said, hey, where, where have the skates gone? In the UK, it was the 1980s. In the United States, it was the 1990s. And there's another one which we really only just noticed uh, in the last few years, which is the sawfish. Now, sawfish were a very predominant uh, species in tropical and, and warm temperate estuaries around the world. And yet they have been serially eliminated from those ecosystems over the last hundred years or so, uh, largely as a result of gill netting and bottom trawling uh, in those regions. And so, you know, we, and, and occasionally recreational fishing. This is a recreational boat uh, which has gone out. And I just wonder, you know, how much were you enjoying it by the time you got to your 27th sawfish that day? It's, it's quite extraordinary to see something like this. And it's also quite extraordinary to think that people ever thought that this could continue. How long could you carry on doing this on a daily basis or a weekly basis and think that it would still be possible in the days and years to come? So the world is changing very rapidly and sometimes gradually. And those gradual creeping changes are the ones that we fail to notice. Uh, most, but there are, there are very substantial changes taking place as a result of species additions as well. And one of them is unfolding in the Caribbean right now as a result of the, the spread, uh, the explosive spread of uh, lionfish around the, the Caribbean coral reefs. Now, lionfish are from the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean. Um, they got into the uh, reefs of the Florida Keys, probably an aquarist released them in the 1990s. And now they're all over the place. And they go down to depths of hundreds of meters. And you can find them from South America to the Carolinas and from uh, uh, Panama all the way across to Bermuda. And they are munching their way through Caribbean reef fish uh, at a huge rate. They are, you know, there's no experience with them in, among these Caribbean fish. They're growing to twice the size they do in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And who knows where it will end? But the experience, the baseline that people are going to have of Caribbean coral reefs is going to change yet again as a consequence of this. And how long is it before we really come to accept these things? Well, you know, a little bit of uh, experience from our own country is worth uh, bearing in mind. You know, things like the horse chestnut, which we think of as being uh, totally an embedded part of our landscape and a much loved one. Um, but it really is a fairly recent arrival, all the same. And uh, you know, we accept those changes, we accommodate them, and we, uh, we come to love what we might have hated in the first place. And here's a very good example of that in a cultural context. And I, I, I owe uh, Julia Bradbury's Walks uh, program for this on television. And, and I particularly like it. This is Monseldale in Derbyshire, and um, uh, it's got this a uh, rather lovely winding valley and uh, a, a viaduct running through it, now no, no longer used. Um, but in the 19th century, when this railway was being built through this dale, uh, uh, John Ruskin launched a, a, a really vitriolic attack on uh, the despoiling of his beautiful valley here. And I, I must give you the quote because it's absolutely wonderful. There was a rocky valley between Buxton and Bakewell, once upon a time, divine as the Vale of Tempe. You enterprised a railroad through the valley. You blasted its rocks away, heaped thousands of tons of shale into its lovely stream. The valley is gone and the gods with it. And now every fool in Buxton can be a Bakewell in half an hour, and every fool in Bakewell at Buxton, which you think a lucrative process of exchange, you fools everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that, you know, it's a, a piece of criticism. It's, uh, it's marvelous. And, uh, but the, the irony about this is that when they closed the railway and uh, there was, it was proposed to knock down the viaduct, uh, a, a, a committee was established to protect and preserve the viaduct. And it's now a listed building. So you see, we, we hate something and then we come to love it. It's just a, a generational change in our feelings about the environment. And our, we get generational changes in all sorts of things. One of them is in the food we eat. So 
Sturgeon were incredibly common in the uh, um, late Dark Ages, early Middle Ages, uh, and we know that from archaeological remains, the middens uh, all over the country, where there are lots and lots of sturgeon bones in it. It's food of the common people. But that kind of environmental change, the mechanical change and the pollution happened early on in European estuaries. And so we started damming them. Um, in King Alfred's day, there were something like 800 mill dams across rivers in England. By the time of the Doomsday Book, that had grown to something like 5,000. And so the migration runs of sturgeon were blocked. The habitat was changing as a result of agriculture and uh, land erosion. The rivers were becoming turbid, slower flowing, and the sturgeon dwindled very rapidly. And uh, by the 12th century, the sturgeon was declared a royal fish, a sign of prestige accorded to something that was uh, now a great rarity and highly valued. And um, it's still a royal fish, so if you catch one, you have to offer it to the crown, but uh, you might also be arrested because it's a protected species now. Another example is the bluefin tuna, which used to be incredibly common in the North Sea. Tens of thousands would come into the North Sea every year. They, were, uh, they supported a recreational fishery in the 1930s or so. Uh, people really got into fishing them. They were also being exploited commercially at that time. It wasn't much esteemed, though, it had to be said. Um, on the western side of the Atlantic, the uh, bluefin tuna was just turned into pet food. Um, so, you know, the sport was good, but the, uh, the, the, the meat was horrible, or so it seemed. But now attitudes have really changed towards bluefin tuna. And uh, in Japan, it is accorded the highest esteem as a delicacy. And indeed, the price of tuna is extraordinary. And the first tuna sold every year uh, accords uh, just an incredible price. And this one sold for $1.7 <coughs> million in, in 2013. Can you imagine that price for a single individual fish? Partly it's the prestige accorded to uh, the person who has that money to spend that um, comes into it too. And, and here he is uh, wielding the knife, uh, not very expertly it seems, uh, judging by the, the fellow next to him who, who is guiding it. But the experience of fishing is changing uh, in many ways as a result of changes in the marine environment. This is a Sunday morning's catch of white sea bass and yellowtail from the west coast of the United States. And here is a Sunday morning's catch uh, on the west coast of the United States now. Um, of course, they still can catch a few fish as well, but there are other species moving in, taking advantage of the environmental changes that are underway there. Uh, the ones that are favoring the Humboldt squid are the loss of uh, predatory sharks as a result of us fishing them and um, an expansion of the oxygen minimum layer in deeper water, uh, which enables, the, which is, you know, they're adapted for hunting in and around that. And uh, that's expanding as a result of climate change uh, and increasing carbon dioxide levels. So here, you know, the experience uh, that people are having is very different, and, and uh, you can imagine. Uh, quite what um, the, uh, the wives and girlfriends think when they bring home one of these. Uh, <laughs> and here's another shifting baseline, which uh, many of us have experienced over our lifetimes, and that is the change in the visibility of the night sky. This is uh, a picture of the Milky Way taken in the desert, uh, but you can quite readily see the Milky Way in uh, the darkest parts of the countryside in the UK. You could see it from cities even in the past, um, although uh, it, it uh, was never that easy with the, once you started getting gas street lighting coming in. But this, this was something which uh, people in the past really had a much, much deeper connection with and, and all of the, the, the wonder, the sense of wonder that comes from being able to experience that closeness to the night sky. And yet today, this is the sort of thing that people are growing up and experiencing this kind of brown, white out, wash out of the night sky. And, and, and there are places in the city where you can barely see the moon, uh, uh, let alone Jupiter, and certainly not the Pleiades uh, that you were able to see in the past. And so we've, we've been losing that connection to this wonderful, marvelous world of the universe as well. And here is a map of uh, the severity of light pollution in the UK and uh, across much of mainland Europe here. 
And you can see that there are very few places now, really, uh, where um, people are really connecting with the night sky any longer. And it's a great loss to us, uh, uh, which I, I think you know, there, there is now a building awareness of that loss. And also, there's a building awareness of the health consequences of this kind of uh, light pollution, which is um, reducing nighttime melatonin production, which impacts on all sorts of aspects of our health. And there are some cities of the world where you can't even see the sun uh, today, let alone the night sky. This is uh, um, a bad day in China. Uh, and again, children growing up will be really cut off from a lot of the, the beauty and the uh, wonder of the natural world in places like that. Now here is a fascinating example of the shifting baseline syndrome, which um, I came across uh, reading for this lecture. And it was a study done by uh, some people to look at Disney movies over a 70-year time horizon, and they, they, they recorded the number of minutes of outdoor scenes and whether it was a natural scene or a city scene or a kind of semi-natural scene, how many species were depicted in the films and so forth. And, and there is a striking shifting baseline in what our kids are being exposed to these days in terms of the, the movies on TV. And, and there, there's less natural, less, less diversity in those scenes today than there was uh, in the early ones. And you can see that on these graphs. So here's, here's the data that underpin those things. And this is the, uh, the proportion of natural settings in outdoor scenes. So in other words, you know, beautiful woodland, whatever, meadow, uh, et cetera, uh, as opposed to built up settings and then the number of uh, animal species in those settings. So it's, it's declining markedly, and that has to be down to the experience and the, the shifted baseline, really, of the filmmakers. It's them who's doing this thinking, it's them who's imagining the world, and um, they're projecting what their experience is into these movies, and embedding it, therefore, in future generations, in new generations coming uh, through who, who are not seeing those scenes. In, um, in the movies. Now, there's a wonderful example a couple of weeks ago in the Observer uh, magazine uh, in which they interviewed Björk, uh, who is from Iceland. And um, this is typical Icelandic scene. And Björk says uh, that she wants every Icelander to ask themselves the question, do you want to open up aluminium production for a handful of corporations or to preserve one of Europe's last remaining pristine wildernesses? Well, good question, except that it is not a pristine wilderness at all. Uh, this is what much of Iceland looked like, uh, uh, at least half of it, according to the old Norse sagas at the time of colonization. And it was centuries of grazing and uh, erosion which have turned it into that moonscape that Icelanders today obviously love. I have a, an Icelandic student who is totally attuned and uh, uh, in love with the landscape of her island. And yet, um, can you imagine plucking somebody from this land of a, a, a thousand years ago and, and flinging them into the same place today and saying, what do you think? This is great, isn't it? <laughs> I don't think they would exactly. But we have the same phenomenon exactly in the UK. Now, this is the beauty of the Lake District. and. Uh, uh, for many people, this is really iconic of the, uh, the English landscape and wilderness and, and wild beauty. Uh, uh, not to George Monbiot, the um, Guardian columnist and environmental writer. And in his book, Feral, he draws uh, attention to the way that the landscape has been changing and to the fact that all of this would have been a wooded landscape, or much of it, uh, in the past. And that really today's landscape is is very much an artificial construct, and that our policies for nature conservation in the UK are keeping it that way, and keeping it in this altered state. And a flurry of uh, letters coming into the paper, you know, indignant at George Monbiot, criticizing the Lake District and saying, but if you put trees there, you wouldn't be able to see the view. <laughs> Which I thought was, uh, <laughs> was wonderful. You know, this is, this is what it was like uh, in the past. This is Glen Affric in Scotland. That, that's the sort of scene that might have existed in the Lake District of uh, some years ago. Now, the, the thing about environmental change, uh, which is promoting very rapid shifting baselines today, is that the rate of change is speeding up. 
And it's known as the Great Acceleration. Here's trends and a whole range of different things. And what that means is that the, the capacity for a dissonance between generations alive today is even greater than it has ever been. And it, in fact, obviously, the second thing that's going on is that generations are, uh, you know, more generations are alive. We're getting, we're living longer. So there's, a, there's an opportunity for a long distance and experience between people who, uh, who were born early in the, the 20th century and people who are being born today. And, you know, that, that sort of dissonance can explain something of the, the disconnect between the youth and the politicians of today because the experiences are so very different. You know, that, uh, that feeling that politicians are out of touch and they don't have a clue what the youth of today want, etc., is is uh, partly a consequence of that rapidity of change uh, and the, the, the rate of change accelerating uh, as time goes on. Now, adaptability has always been a great feature, and this is the, the Natural History Museum's uh, David Beckham of the Homo erectus world. <laughs> <laughs> I just loved it. You know, you put a headband on and a few, few bits of stuff, and you've got an instant trendy uh, caveman. So, so here we are. But adaptability is the secret, but is it also going to be a liability for us? And that's, that's something which uh, we need to explore. And in terms of what shifting baselines mean and how they might be a liability, it can lead to this kind of ratcheting down of, of quality and expectation and ambition, critically, the ambition to restore things or to manage things better. We accept conditions which are detrimental. Um, you know, we accept living in degraded environments that are a threat to our health, frankly. And therefore, we may also fail to act in our long-term interest. And particularly problematic at this time are, are these two major changes uh, which are underway, which are altering the perceptions uh, at a very high rate between generations. You know, people being born today are being born into a very, very crowded world and much more crowded than the world of their grandparents was. And, and likewise, um, the global environmental change is happening. It's, it's a, a threat to us, a clear and present threat. And yet, uh, shifting baseline syndrome is going to erode our attention to it. It's going to erode our ability to deal with it. Um, and, and here's uh, a, a wonderful encapsulation of that kind of let's not worry about it too much uh, uh, syndrome. <clears throat> you know, ignore it, deny it, talk about it lots, don't do anything about it, maybe do something token. Um, and then finally, when it can no longer be uh, ignored, actually do something about it. And, you know, some people think that we need a good crisis if we're going to really tackle um, uh, the, the problems of the environment around us effectively. And, and we had a good crisis in the heart of uh, modern society. This is Hurricane Sandy uh, combining with a northern storm uh, and just about hit New York. The, the legacy of Sandy is being forgotten really quite rapidly in New York. So it's very easy, you know, and kids being born today just don't know very much about it. In China, there's a recent example, you know, Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square being remembered by people from older generations in China, but the kids of China, well, you know, Tiananmen, what's that all about? The, 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 the shift is happening. Now, <coughs> You know, the grumpy old, uh, old men and old women on TV is uh, a great place for moans, but actually there is an awful lot about the shifting baseline syndrome and our different perceptions of the environment which leads us into thinking uh, rather grumpily, uh, so it seems, in older age. Um, and I, I am coming to the end. I, I realize that, uh, that um, England are playing tonight. And, uh, <laughs> and that your expectations for me are uh, for no more than a few more minutes. Anyway, the post office published this stamp uh, earlier this month, and this is one of the sustainable fishes out of a, a set of five sustainable and five threatened fishes. It's the Cornish sardine, formerly known as the pilchard, but uh, the marketing folks got in, uh, as Cornish sardine sounds better. And, um, you know, today it's a sustainable fishery, but it is a it's a shadow of its former abundance in Cornwall. And really, in the past, the abundance of sardines was like this. The accounts from the 19th century suggest that 
that sardine shoals were darkening the sea for a hundred miles of coastline from Devon through to Cornwall. And uh, that is just something which nobody um, in this room will ever have experienced uh, uh, because the, the, the fishery really crashed in the early part of the 20th century. So our expectations are diminishing over time. Here's an example of what I mean by diminished ambition. In the marine environment, we have set up so far 27 new marine conservation zones. Um, and stakeholders were asked to set the conservation objectives for these areas. And 90% of those objectives were to maintain the environment in its present state, only 10% were to affect recovery to some sort of uh, former better state. Despite the enormous amount of evidence out there that the seas of our country have uh, been depleted spectacularly since the 19th century. So this is what I mean about embedding diminished expectations in our present management practices. Now, I, I, uh, Bernard Shaw was an old cynic uh, at heart, uh, but a great humorist. and. You know, I think nobody would disagree with this, but uh, I think that we've got to use history much more in order to try and counter this phenomenon of the shifting baseline and make history relevant to younger generations in terms of, uh, uh, of the environment and, and try and restore things that we value about the environment and that we need about the environment to sustain human well-being. Now, there is a p positive uh, uh, benefit to being older, uh, and one of those is that uh, people shift their attitudes, they do shift uh, over time, and particularly in response to their experience, and here's three examples of people who uh, shot and fished their way through a large amount of wildlife before coming to the conclusion that maybe it wasn't such a good idea and that protection would be a better idea. Um, so we have to use a broader, longer-term perspective, much more in, um, in environmental debates, because you know, younger generations aren't seeing the world the way that older generations are, and these perspectives really matter if we're going to protect the environment. And the problem for younger generations is that their experience is changing uh, very, very uh, much. And uh, one of the trends which is underway, is, which is forcing us to become more and more isolated from the natural world, is is that people are living in cities. Now, for football fans, this is Sao Paulo. It's one of the most depressing places I've ever flown into because from horizon to horizon, it looks much like this with barely a scrap of green in among it. And you can see how the urbanization is increasing over time. So a bigger and bigger fraction of people will be experiencing this. And we really need to try and find ways of uh, connecting people with the natural world in a meaningful way, even as these trends unfold. And one of the ways that we can help also counter the phenomenon of shifting baselines is by establishing really good protected areas within which not only we're trying to preserve what's there now, but we're trying to provide the conditions for a big comeback by life. And here's one example of it happening as a result of community activity in Scotland. This is the community of Aran Seabed Trust Marine Protected Area between the mainland coast and Holy Island there. And um, it is working extremely well. It's been protected now since 2008, but it is the only fully protected marine reserve in Scotland, and it's one of only three in the United Kingdom up until now. So those sorts of efforts can really help uh, re-establish the connection, I think, between us and uh, what we have lost. And a final thought here, though, and that is that when you think about shifting baselines, people immediately start to think, well, what should we try and aim for in getting our environment back? And I think that's probably the wrong question, because the environment is changing in, in many ways. And to say, this point in time, that's where we want to be is, uh, I think, going about it the wrong way. Really, what we want to do is to provide the conditions for the environment to flourish, for, for wildlife to flourish, and to support human well-being uh, in, in its fullness, um, but as well as uh, maintaining space on the planet just for wildlife. And, and I think that, you know, by providing the conditions, those ecosystems will redevelop in ways that are appropriate for the environment of today. We're not going to get the mammoths back. They've gone for good. 
unless you have to be one of these uh, uh, geneticists busily uh, <laughs> trying to extract DNA right now and um, <laughs> conjuring monsters from your test tubes. But anyway, uh, I'm not. So I, I leave you with that thought. It's really all about re-establishing the possibilities for nature. And I, I think in terms of the meeting that the Linnean Society might uh, uh, think of holding on shifting baselines, um, I, I've taken this from a very natural science point of view, but um, there, there are a whole range of interesting psychological and social and cultural aspects to the phenomenon of shifting baselines, which can also be explored uh, to, I think, with great value. So I leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you.